And I think probably that is what happened with Jesus a lot. He probably let go of a lot of beautiful thoughts and teachings that probably seemed to catch a lot of people off guard initially, but they, they felt the kindness and the warmth and the friendliness and the joy behind what was being said. The presence was there, and then that's what turned them toward him. And the ego, of course, it doesn't really apply that way. When we talk about the scribes and the Pharisees, that's just a symbol for the ego, which has a very strong investment in this world being real. Power, control, rituals, uh, being right. And a lot of those teachings that came through Jesus were a total dismantling of that. That's why the scribes and the Pharisees were so angry was it was a threat to their perceived power. You know, they were the ones that were looked to as the ones that were giving the religious instruction from God, you know, the, in the high places. Almost like uh, the church, uh, of course over the many centuries we've, we've seen like the different churches, the Catholic Church and the different hierarchies and the, the control over money and and therefore power, and, and so on and so forth. But with Jesus, he was basically giving this teaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and it's within you, and it doesn't have anything to do with, with politics, or power, or control, as the world judges it. It has nothing to do with that. So that was what the big threat was to the Pharisees and the scribes. They were basically concerned for their positions. <coughs> and concerned, like, uh, if this guy keeps talking like this, uh, we're going to be out of a job uh, quickly. So we've got to be careful, watch this guy, track this guy, do something about that. I shared stories too, when I went to Canada one time, um, I was asked to speak at a religious science church, you know, kind of a new thought church and pretty open-minded religious science church. They were doing a 10-day series, I believe, on the Buddha at the, at the religious science church. So that's pretty open-minded. So I went there and I had four people with me that I was traveling with and I spoke a little bit during the morning service and then in the afternoon we, I just took a microphone and we passed it around and we just had a typical nice deep session, you know, where you really go deep into the mind, which was basically that you have the calling, you have the answer within you, and you can access that. Uh, it was a beautiful three, four hour talk. And then, uh, when I left, I got back to Cincinnati and about a couple weeks later, I think another Course in Miracles teacher was coming up there, and uh, his name was Robert Perry, and, and they wrote an email saying uh, that that Robert Perry would not be allowed in the sanctuary due to the controversial nature of the previous uh, Course in Miracles teacher. And I thought, oh my, controversial nature. I have a good time up there. I didn't see anything controversial in telling people that the truth is within themselves and they need not look to ministers and structures <laughs> and, and things like that. And they also happened to put in the email that the church attendance had dropped the following week by a significant amount uh, after I was there. But see, so I mean, it's, the message of Jesus is, is not really meant to be a popular message. This is the ego's world. How, how do we expect the message of the Christ to go over in the ego's world? You know, if Jesus was a stand-up comedian, Chances are there'd be some hecklers. Uh, if you look at the politicians, Barack Obama and the politicians and all the hecklers that show up at those rallies and those speeches, imagine if, if Jesus started just sharing these ideas about the unreality of the cosmos and the reality of love. You know, that's not always going to go over big. And so, that's one of the things you start to experience, I think, in this journey is that you're going for an experience. You're not really going for a popularity contest. You're not trying to win over people. You're not trying to, like in the old days of evangelism, save souls, win souls for Christ. Thank you, Jesus. You know, 
wait, whoa, whoa, praise the thons and all this and this. We're, we're talking about a state of mind that's, that's joyful and happy and peaceful consistently. And that is no small gift. As many who have come before us have, have made an attempt at that experience. Let me go for that lasting happiness. You know, that is no small gift to go for that. So, we were talking at the breakfast table this morning and I was saying, yeah, I, I really, I really just go generally where I'm invited. Um, uh, there was one time when somebody came to me and they said, uh, if everything is just so perfect, like you're talking about, why go anywhere? You know, why go anywhere in the world or why even travel at all? And I said, I know exactly how you feel. That's exactly how I feel. Why go anywhere? It's really, there's no impetus for it. Um, it's, I'm not trying to change the world, I'm not trying to, to build something, grow something, ex, you know, expand something. This isn't, you know, the Kingdom of Heaven is not like the gross national product. Uh, you're not trying to like, wait till the, the GNP report comes out. How's our Kingdom report doing? <laughs> How many billions of dollars do we have here? Sometimes when you listen to the televangelists, you might believe that it had something to do with it. Just send in, we have a plant for you, or a statue, or a candle. This authentic candle, you know, from such and such, from Lourdes, or from, you know, Assisi, or something. Uh, there was a, a teacher one time that was, like, uh, he was charging money for taking people into these these caves, mystical caves in in, uh, in Israel, or sometimes you'll see that you know these little bottles of oil, the actual oil that, that Jesus Christ you know was anointed with on his feet and everything you know, and selling these little bottles, you know, it's just amazing how the ego will just try to commercialize anything. I was I was in the southwest a number of years ago, and I went to this beautiful little uh, chapel that had been built, and the chapel had kind of a legendary story around it, that, that they had a, a group of nuns that had come from, from Europe, and they'd come over there, and they had wanted to build this chapel, and it was, you know, kind of, you know how the southwest is, it's quite dry and arid down there, and this was a bit um, isolated and so forth, and so, they just kept praying and praying, and a, a carpenter showed up and built these beautiful, they actually had part of the chapel and the area built, but they had no way to get to the loft, to the top part. And this carpenter showed up and built this beautiful kind of a spiral staircase with these steps interlocking, and they'd never seen anything like it. You know, the architecture and the way that these steps, without any like means of support. It's just one step was supported by the next and the next without any kind of under support. And the legend spread that it was it was Jesus. Jesus had showed up in the southwestern United States and built this staircase and then mysteriously disappeared. So anyway, I went there, I heard the whole spiel about the thing, went and looked at the steps. I couldn't even walk on the steps. They were roped off, you know. And just like now like part of a museum. You could look at the steps but you couldn't walk on the steps. And then they had built around this chapel uh, a shopping mall. <laughs> uh, nothing like a little bit of commercialism to build in there. So you had it's this chapel with these legendary steps, so called, and then this shopping area. You could go with all these shops. It had been totally commercialized. And you know, that's the ego's trick. It's just going to try to commercialize everything. You know, with, Christmas was just supposed to be a simple reminder of holiness, you know, uh, of the holiness, of symbolic of the birth of the Christ uh, coming to this world, a world of darkness and chaos, a, a beam, a beacon of light. And then you look at how commercialized Christmas is. Did you buy me something? Am I on your list? Okay, then I'm going to cross you off then if I'm not, you know, it's all this exchange and materialism. Easter, you know, Great symbol of the resurrection. Chocolate, bunny rabbits, Easter egg hunts, you know, 
you kind of sniff around to even find a, a resurrection story there going on at Easter anymore because it's, the ego has so commercialized anything that would remind the sleeping mind of holiness. You know, it's got to be covered, covered immediately and covered in disguise. Then Halloween, that's kind of an interesting uh, holiday, you know, skeletons and death and candy all combined. Death and sweetness put together. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, and then Halloween was kind of a reaction to a, a holiday that was a little more pronounced over in Europe, All Saints Day. Uh, you know, Halloween was just put right next to All Saints Day and it did the job. When I was growing up, I never heard of All Saints Day. I heard of Halloween, that was a big deal. Trick or treat. Listen to that. Trick or treat. It's not even subtle. <laughs> That's the ego's plan for salvation. Trick you or treat you. Treat you nice in all kinds of ways that the ego has set up to trick you. So it's not really trick or treat. It's trick and treat. You get tricked and treated in, uh, in a way that really is not a, a real treat at all. Forgiveness, the miracle, offers an actual treat. When the mind is, is caught up in conflict, it needs forgiveness to come back to stability, to stabilize, to find consistency, harmony, you know, coherence, to be in alignment. You know, you know, it will take a miracle to have that alignment. And it's not really like an intervention from beyond uh, this world, we could say that the Holy Spirit was, was given simultaneously as the answer. And so, as long as the ego has seemed to exist, the Holy Spirit has always been there. Uh, it's just that Jesus was the first to kind of tune in so much that He's our symbol of, oh, it's not what it seems. This world is not what it seems. And it's more than that, it's really not anything at all. But it's just definitely not what it seems. And so that's why Jesus is called like an elder brother or a way shower. Not a figure to be worshipped. Uh, basically a lot of this ideas of praising God and praising Jesus and everything. God and Jesus we could say really have no ego with which to receive the praise. So, you know, if you just constantly are just praising, 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 like sometimes the praise a Lord, we lift your name up. How many times do you have to lift the name up? Uh, we lift your name up, we lift your name up. And then, out of the church, the same old lack of integrity and things that come from following the ego. So, it's more your kindness and your gentleness and your friendliness to your fellow, fellow brothers and sisters and yourself that's how God is praised. Because the kindness and the gentleness and the love was the way you were created. And because you were created that way, to acknowledge yourself as you were created, that is the greatest way of praising the Creator. 